Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Hola creadores digitales, mi nombre es León Ramos y estamos aquí en el Festival de Software de Vallarta que está a punto de terminar, estamos a nada y tengo el agrado de estar aquí con una eminencia, eh, Ron Minick y él, eh, si no lo conocen, se los presento, él trabaja con Linux Boot, con Core Boot, con Ore Boot vaya, eh, está haciendo cosas muy interesantes y eh, tengo el agrado de estar con él y hacerle unas breves preguntas a mí me encantaría que ustedes nos acompañen en esta, en esta transmisión eh, la primera es eh, una de las preguntas que tenemos es how how long have you been working with uh, firmware with BIOS? How many years ago? The first one I wrote was 1978. 1978. That's before PCs existed. Okay. But I've worked on a lot of many many different things. Uh -huh. But I started open source BIOS for PCs in 1999. That's a long, that's, that's a long way. Yeah, it's okay. a long way, and actually, most of the time since then, I haven't really worked on that as my, as my main thing. I did a lot of work in operating systems research too, uh -huh. but I had, I got back into it in 2017 because, with Linux boot, because uh, we were locked out of server. We couldn't get core boot on server uh -huh. back then. Okay. So Linux boot was the way of solving that problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, You are working at Google, Google yeah. platforms, yeah. and uh, you are developing Linux boot, Core yeah. boot, and Ore boot. Yeah. Uh, why is it important to uh, have Linux or an uh, um, I don't know a code that you know on firmware? Why is why is oh, that important? Um, so since 1999, when firmware was only let's just say several kilobytes in size to 2019 when firmware is actually almost 16 megabytes in size okay it's gotten far more complex uh -huh. far more capable of doing harm and there's a many many demonstrated examples where malware was embedded in firmware either uh -huh. by accident or on purpose yeah and so what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of firmware that is not known in what as to what it does and Uh, I mentioned in the talk there's a large part of that from where we know we can delete or replace uh -huh. and it also happens to be where most of the problems are. Uh -huh. So we, we're removing the problematical part. There's a part left behind that we can't remove, which uh -huh. is the part that turns on extremely low level early parts of the hardware. Uh -huh. But the problems that have been discovered generally are not in the part that in that part, it's in the, the stuff we're removing. Okay. Which it turns out. What kind of problems? What, what are we talking about? So Security what's been issues? discovered, uh -huh. uh, and, and, and again in a part we are removing, what's been discovered is um, software that can send emails uh -huh. to places in in the firmware. In, in the firmware. Okay. Not only that, the passwords for servers at vendors for the so they can log in and send the email. For remote assistance. Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, software that lets a remote company, not your own, grab control uh -huh. of your system. Uh, they've discovered all kinds of uh, material, private keys, uh, keys that have the um, string do not send attached to them, or do not, you know, test only, do not install, uh -huh. that's in there. So a tremendous number of either intentionally or unintentionally created vulnerabilities. Uh -huh. uh, and there's no way really to fix this because it's closed source. The only option is to just remove it. And okay. that's what we're doing. We're okay. removing as much of that as we can and still have a working computer system. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. How was Corbut born? I'm sorry? How, how oh, was Corbett uh, born? So Corbett initially was called Linux BIOS, uh -huh. and I started that project in 1999 at Los Alamos National Labs. Uh -huh. And I started that mainly because the, we had a 128 node cluster, uh -huh. and every node took at least five minutes to boot. It, it's kind of hard to describe just how terrible that software, the bio software was in every imaginable way. Uh -huh. and, and I, Were they uh, basic chain? I mean, the, the booting it was, process? No, but it, even then, it was. there were a lot of other problems with the, the BIOS. Uh -huh. And so, uh, 
and there were a few security issues around that BIOS because of, of the fact that anyone could walk up to a computer and put in a floppy disk and take control of the computer. Uh -huh. So um, what I realized was that because of the, the way the buses were structured in the newer systems, uh -huh. the hardware was all self-identifying. So in older systems, there were all these little switches and jumpers you had to set mm -hmm. to define what hardware you had in a machine. Uh -huh. And in newer systems, that could all be determined from by software reading registers. Okay. And that meant we really didn't need almost everything the BIOS did. And so what I realized is I could take Linux and replace the BIOS with a Linux kernel because the, the chip was big enough to hold it. And now I had a new thing I could call Linux BIOS. Uh -huh. So we use Linux BIOS as purely was a supercomputing uh -huh. um, product. And then other people use it for other things. So iRobot used it in their mind finding robot called the PacBot. Uh -huh. uh, a company used them in uh, digital television later in, the, in that decade. Um, it was used in a, in a modem, used in a military helicopter. Uh -huh. It was the Apache military modem too. So once people realized they could put Linux as their BIOS and get rid of the BIOS and all its problems, mm -hmm. the usage grew tremendously. Okay. And then the, the um, German government sponsored a Linux BIOS port for a laptop called the GETAC 470. Uh -huh. And but around about 2008, we decided to change the name because the, this is this was a different time. Just using the name Linux in in, in anything. A lot of people were still uncomfortable with having Linux oh, in the BIOS, okay, okay. including Sun Microsystems and Microsoft. So we thought we would change the name, and uh, so it became Corbett. Corbett. Okay. Yeah. Great. And uh, how many brands of uh, laptops or PC are using Corbett? Really, at this moment, it's, you'd have to say it's only Chromebooks, but there are probably one or two hundred different kinds of Chromebooks by this time. So. Yeah. Uh, if you pick up a Chromebook, it's running core boot now. Okay. And, and yeah. Uh, I saw your presentation, and you were talking about core boot. That basically is core boot without C. Core boot is core boot with all the C removed. Okay. Uh, so it's what's called a downstream fork because we 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 build on that core boot base, but we've removed anything that is C code. Uh -huh. And. Uh, we're very happy because we've moved to Rust. It's a great language, and the, the tooling and everything for Rust is just a big jump. Yeah, so big step you're up using Rust C. instead yeah. of C. Yes. And uh, why did you choose Rust? So C, if you look at it, is a 50-year-old language. It was uh -huh. designed in the days of 16-bit mini computers. There are many things you can do in C that are very dangerous. Uh -huh. And Rust ensures because of the way the language is designed you can no longer do those things mm -hmm. and so rather than worry about whether uh, I call a function and the function retains a copy of the data or a pointer to the data I, I all those concerns go away because Rust ensures that I can't do that mm -hmm. Rust has the concept of what's called a mutable variable and that means I can change the variable uh -huh. and the rule is there can only ever be one copy of a mutable variable or there can be many unmutable copies of that variable, but not both at the same time. Okay. So many, many common programming errors just simply are not possible in Rust. Okay. And really almost any C language feature I look at that is a problem, I can move over to Rust and discover that problem no longer exists. Okay. And that's intentional because the people who designed Rust knew where all the problems were and, and set out to fix them. That's great. Yeah. What's the future of Arboot? We're hoping that Orboot will be an option people look at where they might have looked at U-Boot or Coreboot. The reason being that it's for a typical port, there's one-tenth the number of lines of code in Orboot as in Coreboot. Uh, it has a great deal of, of increased safety as compared to Orboot and something like U-Boot. Uh -huh. And it's, it's really, I think, the language we, of the future. So in the early 70s, it was obvious that C was a language that was going to be a very heavily used language. Uh -huh. And I would say right now and for the past few years, it's been clear that Rust has got very, very good use case for things like operating systems and firmware. So okay. I see Rust really, really right at kind of where C was in 1974 or so, where it was just about to take off. 
and and explode in usage. I, I think I kind of see that happening today. That's great. That's yeah. great. And is it hard or easy uh, for a newcomer to start working with uh, Corvut or to, to test it? So I follow, there's a guy named Brian Cantrill who's been a real Rust advocate for a while now and his advice is you get a book called Programming Rust and you work your way through that book and you write every line of code you see, you write that line of code again and then that will, uh, by the time you're done, you'll be good at Rust. Okay. Uh, but, so, uh, talking about uh, Corbut or Dorbut, is, is it hard or easy for a newcomer to... Uh, to Corbut's really or? easy. Actually, our Corbut's pretty easy too. We put a lot of work into Orbit and into allowing you to basically say uh, the, the, the make for, for Orbit is called Cargo and you say Cargo and make and then run uh -huh. and it will build the entire Orbit and then start it up in an emulator for you. So it's single step and you're done and okay. it's running. So I actually feel Corbut does a good job making it easy for a beginner, but Orbit actually makes it even easier. Okay, so uh, just go ahead and try it, test it. Yeah. Uh, and tell us what you think. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how come uh, our uh, listeners uh, or uh, viewers uh, find you, find the, the, the project, the oh, download links? Please uh, go to github.com slash orboot slash orboot and you'll find the Orboot tree there and if you go to linuxboot.org you'll also find more information about Linux Boot. Mm -hmm. and we have a Slack channel and we'd be delighted to, to have more people join in. There is a mailing list. What I find interesting nowadays when you have a Slack channel, the mailing list is almost never active. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to talk to us, please join our Slack channel. Great. And uh, we're happy to have you here in Mexico. And uh, also, how, how did you find the, the, the summit? This is a fantastic conference, fantastic people, very, very, very smart people. And uh, the hospitality was just outstanding. Great. So I really well, hope to hear from some of the people here because I've enjoyed every second. That's great. That's great. Uh, Ron, I'm, I'm so, so glad to, to talk to you and uh, to, uh, I don't know, to have this news about the Orbit and the cross language that you're using now. So I'm, I'm so glad. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. I have a present for you. Oh my gosh, thanks. Uh, we are uh, giving oh. a small tote. Okay, I won't say no to that. <laughs> thanks again. Yeah. Creadores, digitales. Creadores, digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales. Creadores digitales.